good to see everybody tonight. We are glad you're with us. Let's do a little singing. Would you stand and sing with me a great song called Follow On. It says, Down in the valley with my Savior I would go. Let's sing this together. Down in the valley with my Savior I would go. Where the flowers are blooming and the sweet waters flow. Everywhere he leads me I would follow, follow on. Walking in his footsteps to the crown. first with me. Down in the valley or upon the mountain steep, close beside my Savior would my soul ever keep. He will lead me safely in the path that he has trod, up to where they gather on the hills of God. Follow, follow, I would follow Jesus. singing tonight. Let's go Lord in prayer. We'll ask the Lord to be with us in all of our services. Our children's services are having their Bible study in our back area. Our teens are over in our gym and good heavens. I thought this last week we had over 50 something come and this week it looks more and I thought I, I figured we reached our peak last week. A lot of our we're in a contest right now. They they've got one more week and uh, if they bring a lot of visitors, their visitors count for their points. They're working for a pizza party for whoever wins this thing. And every every week I hear the same thing. They're cheating. They're cheating. Every team's cheating. And so I'm not sure how this is. They're all close to. And uh, so a lot of kids tonight brought a lot of visitors. And I thought, good heavens, we've got as many visitors tonight as we do uh, the kids that come all the time. So that's a good deal. Let's go in prayer and ask the Lord to bless our, our teens as well as here in the auditorium and our children's service tonight. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we love you and thank you and praise you for everything that you do for us. And we pray that you just be with the time as we spend together in our Bible studies. Pray that you would touch our hearts and, and as we uh, study and open up your word tonight, may it apply to our lives. And, and if there's anyone here tonight that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, may tonight be the night they come to be saved. Pray that you just speak to people's hearts, and as we leave here tonight, our hearts would be drawn closer to you. And so, Lord, bless this evening, and may we hear from you this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated, but keep singing with us. There's a great song called Come and Dine. I haven't sung this in a while. Let me ask you a question. How many of you, you're not sure you've ever heard this song before before we start singing them? Just a few of you, all right. The rest of you, sing out really loud. We want to make sure we get it all done. Jesus has a table spread where the saints of God are fed. Sing with me. Jesus has a table spread where the saints of God are fed. He invites his chosen people come and dine. With his manna he doth feed and supplies our every need. Oh, tis sweet to sup with Jesus all the time. Come and dine, the master calleth, come and dine. You may feast at Jesus' table all the time. He who fed the multitude, turn the water into wine. To the hungry calleth now, come and dine. I like this last verse, sing it with me. Soon the Lamb will take his bride to be ever at his sight. All the host of heaven will assembled be. Oh, it would be a glorious sight. All the saints in spotless white. And with Jesus they will feast eternally. Come and dine, the Master calleth, come and dine. You may feast at Jesus' table all the time. He who fed the multitude Turn the water into wine, to the hungry calleth now, come and dine. Well, that's good singing. We'll sing another one in just a little bit. Past couple of weeks, we've just had some fun uh, right at the first of the service with just some comedy stuff from a Christian comedian. Past couple, <coughs> excuse me, the past couple of weeks has been with Jeff uh, 
almost said Jeff Foxworth, that's not true, uh, Jeff Allen, and uh, he's been talking about his son in the first car, and so now he's talking about the cars that he has had. Last week we left it with the Geo Metro car, the three-cylinder one, and now he's going to talk about one tonight that, uh, man, I think a lot of us, we would wish we could go back and find one somewhere that's still running. Listen to this. I had a real car when I got married, man. It was a 1966 Cadillac Coupe de Ville. Yeah. One day my kid asked me, what does Coupe de Ville mean? Oh, it's a French word. It means boat. Yeah. Well, at least it had a horn in it. Changing lane. Huge car. Had a Geo in the trunk in case it broke down. I love that Cadillac. They made them out of metal in 1966, man. Not like the Geo, aluminum plastic. Sorry, I'm late, honey. Got knocked into a ditch by a big horse fly. Man, there were no airbags in a 66 caddy because you didn't need them in 66. Hit something doing 40 miles an hour, get out of the car to see what it was you crushed. <laughs> Ran over a worm in my Geo and I messed up the suspension. <laughs> yeah, I'm driving along, I was like, whoa. That had to be a night crawler. <laughs> Just lucky the sunroof was open. I loved that Cadillac. Then one day my wife asked the fatal question, just sitting at the breakfast table, trying to mind my own business, not even making eye contact. Just... She says, you know, I was thinking. Every man in his room knows when your wife says. You know, I was thinking. All she was thinking about is things you're going to have to do. She slides his paper at me. She says, how many miles per gallon does that Cadillac of yours get? I said, miles? <laughs> Remember the engine man? I had a carburetor built by Hoover. I leave it running. The guy pumping gas. We go, I better shut it off. I can't keep up. The car started to die. I revved the engine. I went, vroom, and I sucked the attendant into the tank, man. Driving around, I got gym shoes hanging out of my tank. Love that car. All right. <laughs> well, that's his story. And uh, so you've heard, if you've been here the past three weeks, you followed right through. Well, listen, we got a couple of announcements real quick. Uh, the Vacation Bible School for the Children is ending this Sunday. And uh, they got a big day planned because right after church is over with, they're going to Mr. Gaddy's. And so make sure your kids come and grandkids come. Get them to bring their friends with them this Sunday and finish on a great day. Uh, one of the kids were saved last Sunday, which was great. And uh, so they want to finish on a good note this Sunday. So make sure that uh, the kids that come with you, that if they're in kindergarten through fifth, they line up some friends that you would swing by and pick them up on the way. And that would be a great thing. Uh, we do have vans that run in different areas. If they arrive, be sure and let us know by Saturday. And that way we can get them fixed up. But that ends this Sunday, so great deal. Another thing uh, we've been telling you about, this is if you're just interested, uh, tomorrow night uh, you want a caravan out there and you want to see where we go to youth camp, uh, you can go with us. It's about a 45-minute uh, drive out there, uh, winding through the <laughs> mountains, I guess if you can call that. And uh, it's the closest thing to mini Colorado that I can get to in the wintertime. This thing is built down in a canyon, and so when you get down in there, you see mountains, and that's something that's weird to see in West Texas. And uh, But it's a really cool place, and if you'd like to go, uh, you can caravan out there with us. We're going to be having snacks, Cokes, watermelon, all that stuff. It's kind of a teen activity that we do, but we invited everybody that wanted to go out there. Our teens will be in the vans and stuff like that, but if you want a caravan out there, we'd love to have you go. You don't have to stay the whole time. We have it from 7 to 9 o'clock. 
and uh, and then if you don't want to stay the whole time, that's fine. Uh, our teams will, and uh, we've got uh, big ball volleyball stuff that's going to be in the gym. They can shoot, they can play basketball, all that stuff. Uh, right outside of the gym, there's a man-made water slide. That's a lot of fun, and uh, we'll get all that stuff set up and ready to go. Uh, that's tomorrow night, and that's our last activity with our teen stuff before we get into camp, uh, get into school. And so I was asked to some of the uh, teens tonight, I said, man, are y'all ready for next Wednesday? And almost every one of them said, I am excited. I thought, I never was excited about going back to prison. That was just never a fun thing to me. That's just the way I looked at it. And um, furlough in the summer just didn't last too long and stuff. So, uh, but they are all excited about going back to school. Um, probably a lot of them are excited to go back to school to get away from the home, the parents and everybody else. And the parents are excited they're getting out of their refrigerator and stuff. So uh, that's a lot of stuff happening. And so that's tomorrow night. Uh, then the next, the next thing we got going, our journey class, and not this Sunday, but next Sunday on, uh, on August the 21st, we are having a deal that we started doing a couple of years ago called Back to School Luncheon Celebration Day. And we do it at noon for everybody that's in our journey class, our adult classes over here in, in the North Hall. And uh, they're, they stay, they have lunch, and we're having, I think we're doing pulled pork. And, um, Paul and them are fixing the pulled pork, and that's a lot better than the store bought. I can tell you that. So uh, we'll we'll have we'll eat good, everything. If you're in our journey class, and all the fam your family can stay, and we'll have a good time. It's kind of a uh, kick off to school and uh, get them back in. The following week after that, on uh, August the 29th, uh, on a Monday. We're having our first ladies get together, our ladies fellowship. This is for our, all of our adult ladies, all of our teen young ladies, and we'll tell them about that too. Uh, they'll be in the North Hall, 6.30. Uh, that night, they're doing a taco uh, dinner that night. Uh, when, you, when you come at 6.30, they'll get it all ready, and you can eat fellowship for a while. And then uh, Carrie Hendricks is going to do the speaking that night. And so they're, they're planning on having a great evening, but it won't be great unless you come. And so we need you to come to that and invite some uh, lady friends to come with you. And uh, we'll see a great kickoff. Believe it or not, despite it's 100 degrees, you know, we're kicking off our fall season. And so that'll be in a couple of weeks on a Monday night, August 29th, 630. Uh, we'd love to have you come. Also on the same night on August the 29th, our guys go to Potter's Pizza. We had thought about changing, but I don't think we can beat Potter's Pizza because Potter Pizza, pizza has pizza, uh, buffalo wings, salad, and desserts, and Cokes, and sweet tea. For $10, you can't beat that. And so uh, we're, we asked all the guys to go to that. We checked in a couple other places, but it's a lot more expensive stuff right now. And so we're asking all the guys, we ask our team guys to come too. And uh, we're hoping to see a good night. We'll, we'll reserve the room for us uh, on, that, on that night too. So same night, same time. Uh, it's only that the ladies is free. Guys is not. Guys is 10 bucks or more, whatever your, whatever your age is. And if they ever ask you, uh, you know, do you want your seniors discount? I don't care if that offends you or not, take it. They, because that, that saves you money. And so we have one of our guys, they ask him, they said, are you a senior? And he got, he got a little irritated. And uh, I stepped up next, I said, how much is a discount? But, uh, I'll take that. And so, you know, you don't be embarrassed. And so, uh, but we'll have a good time. And uh, we, we sit around talking and, and uh, it's a great way to, Great way to have just some uh, camaraderie that night. So guys, be sure and come to that as well. Our ladies' uh, trip in September is on September the 17th, and so looking forward to that. I was at a fellowship the past two days in Snyder, and uh, yesterday they talked about uh, the ladies' deal in at Calvary, and um, they. So let me just kind of lay this out. Uh, they have to ha you need to kind of be there about 8 30 that morning it's over in Snyder so we're going to leave and Joanne will tell you what time and everything I'm just driving the van that's all I know and so I'm going to drive the van over there so if you ride in the van y'all don't have to be quiet and so <laughs> I'm just kidding and uh, but we're going to drive the van we got a couple of cars going and everything over there and uh, then uh, 
Lisa, Lisa Welchel, is that the way you pronounce her name? Lisa Welchel is going to be the speaker. She was on the Facts of Life, and I told him yesterday, I said, I really liked her. I liked the rebellious one on that, that show, and uh, so, but she's not coming. I'm not, we're not sure if she's a Christian or not, so she's not going to be there. Lisa will, and they said she is a fantastic speaker, and uh, so I want you to be sure and, and uh, come to that. And ladies, and we've already got the tickets bought and paid for and everything's ready to go. Uh, they are going to uh, start around 9, I think, at 9.30, something like that. The doors open at 8.30. It's a general admission deal, so I uh, want to get you in there. Uh, they, their, their auditorium is not very deep, and so you, if you sit in the bottom area somewhere, it doesn't matter. you got a good seat in the house, and so we'll get you all seated, and then... Uh, they'll have a session that morning. They're going to provide lunch for you. And then one thing I didn't know about is they're having what they call, I'm not sure I'm saying this right, pop-up businesses. And so uh, in the gym where the, the food and everything is going to be, ladies, you might want to bring extra money. They'll have like jewelry displays and you can buy that and buy some other things. So there's some businesses that will be there that you can buy things and stuff. And I thought, great. Uh, out pops the credit card and everything so uh but it'll be it'll be good unfortunately i'm there i can control it and uh and everything. so we'll see how that goes i doubt that works but anyway hey would you sing with me one song uh right before our our prayer time tonight uh called god leads us along <clears throat> sing with me in shady green pastures so rich and so sweet god leads his dear children along where the water's cool flow base a weary one's feet god leads his dear children along some through the some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through the blood. Some through great sorrow, but God gives a song in the night season and all the day long. Amen. Well, we do appreciate all of you being here tonight. <clears throat> As you know, we always start the, uh, this part of the service with um, uh, praying for our uh, uh, folks that needs our prayers. But uh, before we do that, I want to remind you that uh, if you didn't notice when you came in, uh, Bill put out the financial report for May and June. As you know, Bill's had some health issues, and he's a little bit behind on that, but he's going to uh, catch you up on the, uh, the other two uh, in a couple of weeks. But uh, I want to remind you, when you look at May, you'll see we went way over uh, our goal. And what happens to us is that some, some months we have five offerings and only four uh, weeks of bills. And so if you'll notice in May, we went way over uh, our budget. But in June, uh, we have five weeks of bills and four uh, offerings. And that brings it down to even. But the Lord has been really good to us financially, and we're grateful to Him for that, and we appreciate so very much Him doing that. So if you didn't get your financial report on, on your way in, be sure to pick one up on your way out. Let's talk about your prayer request tonight. This section right over here got special.
Now, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you, Lord, for being so good to us today and this week. And thank you, Lord, for the privilege we have to be here tonight. Thank you, Lord, for being a God who answers prayer. Lord, you've heard the testimonies tonight of how you have been so good to answer our prayers, and we are deeply thankful to you for those blessings. And Lord, the requests that were given tonight, I just pray that any of them that are sick, that your healing hand will be upon them. And any, Lord, that might be unsaved, that you would help them to come to know you as their Savior. And Lord, those that are facing difficult times and have needs in their lives and obstacles to deal with, I just pray that you'd help them and supply the needs about that. And Lord, we love you tonight, and thank you for loving us, and thank you for the privilege we have to have a great Bible study tonight. And so, Lord, bless the children tonight, and Kevin, the teens, and then be with me and fill me with your Holy Spirit. Help me to teach in your power tonight, and we'll just praise you for every blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you so much for coming. As you know, last week we began a brand new um, uh, series that I've just entitled, The One Another of the Bible. Fifty times in the New Testament, it mentions the phrase, one another. We looked last week at uh, four of them, uh, started off with love one another. And that's what Jesus made it clear, that the very foundation of our relationship as Christians uh, to other Christians is the fact that we love. Jesus made it clear, uh, and what he said was, he said, the whole world will know that you're children of God when they see you expressing your love for each other. So the very foundation of our uh, relationship with each other is that we love each other, we care about each other. The word love means to have a deep affection for someone and for their welfare. And so we looked at that last week. Then we looked at uh, be patient with one another. So important if you're going to have a good relationship with people, you've got to have a, uh, you've got to be patient with them. And then we looked at forgive one another. And Jesus made it clear that uh, when someone offends us, we're to forgive them. And if we don't forgive them, we're not going to get forgiveness when we ask for forgiveness. So it's really important for us that we forgive one another. Or if we are the, uh, the, the party that did the hurting, it's important for us to go to them and apologize and make it right and do restitution for that. Then we closed last Wednesday night with encourage one another. So important that we do all of that. Well, tonight we're going to look at three things. I'm really excited about these three things, and I think you'll, uh, you'll agree uh, tonight that they are really good things that... Uh, we have to do in our lives to make sure that we have a great relationship with the people in our life, to make sure that we treat people the way God expects us to. We're going to look, first of all, at bearing one another's burdens. That's so important. And then we're going to look at praying one for another. And then we're going to look at a strange one, waiting on one another. So let's start our study tonight. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 6 and look at verses 1 and 2. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, uh, the word fault there means a sin. If a man be overtaken in a sin, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear you one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. When we talk about uh, bearing somebody's burden, we're talking about giving them a helping hand when they have a problem in their life. And that's one of the things that we're to do, and that is, is that we are to help each other. All of us have burdens to deal with, and it's important for us to step up and meet that need. But the main thing he's talking about in verse 1 is that uh, one of our jobs is when one of our Christian brothers and our sisters falls by the wayside, gets into sin, gets out of church and out of the will of God, it becomes our responsibility to do everything we can to restore them. So listen to verse 1 again. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, in other words, some, one of our brothers and sisters have fallen into sin, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one. And the word restore simply means to fix something back to like it was before it broke. And then we're to do that with the spirit of meekness, considering ourselves lest we also be tempted. And in verse 2 he says, and bear one another's burdens. People all around us are carrying heavy burdens. Some of them are emotional. Uh, some of our uh, burdens are like depression, uh, or like grief, or guilt, or fear. Uh, some of our emotions we have to deal with uh, in a special way. 
Some of our uh, burdens are relational. We have bad relationships. And bad relationships uh, causes us to have heavy burdens. When we don't get along, when a husband and wife doesn't get along, that creates a heavy burden. Uh, when parents and children don't get along, that creates a heavy burden. And also when we have financial problems, that creates a heavy burden. And when we have health issues, that creates a heavy burden as well. So the Bible makes it clear that what we're to do is that we're to bear one another's burdens. And that means that we are to stri strictly to give them a helping hand. Now someone's, uh, verse 1 makes it clear that bearing someone's burden involves helping people when they have fallen in sin to be restored back. Uh, to the original, st original state. Verse 5 is really important. You know, some people uh, just expect everybody to do everything for them. And the Bible makes it clear in verse 5, if you'll notice, it says, for everyone shall bear his own burden. The Bible makes it clear that we are to do everything we can to deal with our burdens. And then after that, then uh, the Lord steps in and he uses people to help us with our burdens. But it's really important that we don't get abused in having people do things for us that they should be doing for themselves. We're not to, as the, uh, as the expert says, we're not to dump on, uh, on others burdens that we're capable of handling ourselves. We're not to ask others to help us with things that we can take care of ourselves. All of you know, and we cover this uh, quite regularly, all of, you sh all of us know that God does not do for us what we can do for ourselves. That God has made it very clear that if we can handle it ourselves, that's his will for us. If we can't handle it ourselves, then we turn to him, and then he either does it himself or has one of us to do that for him. So it's really important that um, we realize that uh, we're not to just let everybody, we're not just lay down and let everybody take care of us. We're supposed to do our own uh, stuff. Second, th uh, Second Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 10 says, If any man would not work, neither should he eat. You remember back when the church first started uh, that they, uh, everybody just became like a commune. Everybody just gave everything they had and they made sure that everybody had everything that they wanted. Well, some people came along and they just wanted to sit back and not work and not do their job and not, not do their contributing part, like people that come to Northside and don't tithe. What a tragedy that is to accept all of the good stuff, all of the, uh, the benefits that comes and not help the church meet those needs. Well, that's the way it was back in those days. It was those people that uh, wanted everybody to do that for them. So they just had a law. If you don't work, you don't eat. And that forced them to do what was the will of God. And the will of God is, is that I'm not to ask you to do things that I can do for myself. But if I don't, uh, if I can't handle it myself, then I have a heavenly father that I approach. And then he takes care of it, however that happens. So if any man would not work, neither should he eat. Now there are times in our lives when we are to re rely on the Lord and not on people. There are things in my life and things in your life that only God can take care of. Sometimes we reach a limit in our life of what we can do, and there are times when God says, here are some things that you'll never be able to take care of, but at that time, I will take care of that for you. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I want you to turn to Psalms, Psalms chapter 40, and look at verse 1 and 2. My voice will come back in just a minute. <clears throat> One of the uh, uh, problems with uh, <clears throat> the hormone therapy is that it makes my voice change uh, <clears throat> and it changes uncontrollably <clears throat> along the way. It'll come back in just a minute. Um, but anyway, <clears throat> I want you to notice in Psalms chapter 40, verses 1 through 4. Now I want you to think about this. <clears throat> David said, I waited patiently for the Lord and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of an horrible pit, uh, out of a miry clay, <clears throat> and set my feet on a rock, and established my goings. He hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear, and shall trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man that maketh the Lord his trust, 
and respecteth not the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. And what he's saying there is, is that there are times when God will come through for us and do things that no one else can do. And all of us do that. You know, that's, one, that's the wonderful thing about being a Christian. We have a Heavenly Father, and we can go to Him, and in those special times, He comes through for us. Bear one another's burdens. Well, let's talk now in the second thing about pray one for another. Uh, turn in your Bible, if you will, to James chapter 5, and look at verse 16. We are to pray one for another, the Bible says. James 5, 16. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The Bible talks praying for each other in accessory prayer. Intercession means that I go to God and I talk to God on your behalf. You go to God and you talk to other people uh, on their behalf. God, I want to pray for your blessings to be upon so-and-so or so-and-so. That is called intercessory prayer. Now, Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25 says, Wherefore he, Jesus, is able to save them to the uttermost that come to God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. How does it make you feel to think about the fact that God has you on his prayer list? You know, uh, we want to be on a lot of people's prayer list, but every, every Christian here tonight is on the Lord's prayer list. He makes intercession for us, like the Bible says. Then also in Romans chapter 8 and verse 26, the Bible says, Likewise, the Spirit, and that's a capital S, talking about the Holy Spirit. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, <clears throat> but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us, with groanings which cannot be uttered. So all of us are aware of the fact that sometimes we don't know how to pray. There are times in my life, Shirley, would you go get me some water, please? Um, there's times in our lives that uh, um, <clears throat> we don't know how to pray. We don't know what to pray for. <clears throat> all of us in our daily quiet times, sometimes we, we ask the Lord, what, Lord, what do I need to do? What do you want me to do? I don't know how to, how to handle this. How do we solve this problem? Or, or what do we do in this situation? And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit takes our petition. We lay it out before God. And then the Bible says that he tweaks it and then makes it work. He tweaks it to where God's will will answer that for us. So Jesus makes intercession for us. The Holy Spirit makes intercession for us. In verse 27 of Romans chapter 8, says, And he, searcheth the, uh, he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is in the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So we're talking about praying for one another. is called intercessory prayer. Now I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 6 and look at verse 18. Thank you very much. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 18. Praying one for another with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So we are to pray for each other. Uh, that's why we have a prayer time every time we have a service, uh, whether it's a Sunday school class or whether it's one of our services here in the auditorium, we always pray for each other. You know, it's, a it's appropriate for us to ask people to pray for us. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 25, Paul said, Brethren, pray for us. So he was giving us the example that it's appropriate to ask people to pray for us. And that's why in our service we say, what can we pray with you about? What do you want us to pray for about that with you? Uh, and when we do that, we're doing what the Lord tells us to do, that uh, we are to pray one for another, uh, and we're watching there unto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Also, it's important to let people know that you're praying for them. Do you do that? I think most of you do that. Most of us, are, are you know, we've been in, in, in experienced uh, having people pray for us and, and having prayed for people, and then God answers the prayer. Uh, 
Well, notice what the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 11. Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy for this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith uh, in power, with power. So Paul is saying here, I want you guys to know I'm praying for you. And it's really important to do that. I, I've told you before that um, uh, there is a group of people uh, that prays for all, uh, uh, churches pray for all of the pastors uh, in that area. And every so often, I'll get, a, uh, I'll get a letter in the mail, and they'll say, uh, Brother Don, this, this uh, week, uh, your name come up, and, uh, and our whole team has prayed this week for God's blessings to be upon you. There's just something about somebody uh, praying for us that is so important. So I want to I tell you, not only ask people to pray for you, but also tell people when you're praying for them. I just want you to know I'm talking to God on your behalf. And it's important that we have specific times to pray and also to stay in an attitude of prayer. I want you to notice, if you will, uh, Mark chapter 1 and verse 35, and Jesus set the example for this. Mark chapter 1, verse 35, And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. One of the things the disciples noted about Jesus was that every morning before they got up, he was already up and out in a solitary place praying. And evidently he prayed out loud and so they could hear him pray. And they began to notice that all the things that he prayed for that morning, uh, God answered that prayer sometime during the day or the next few days. So that's why in Luke chapter 11 they came to him and they said, Lord, would you teach us to pray? Teach us to pray at a specific time like yours every morning or every night if you're not out. But also teach us to just pray. Teach us to realize that this life was not designed for us to live in our own strength. This, this life was designed for us to live uh, with our Heavenly Father answering our prayers. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, pray without ceasing or stay in an attitude of prayer. I'll, I'll never forget, I was reading the, the life story of David Livingston, the great missionary to uh, Africa. And uh, there was a young preacher that was sent from the mission board over to spend some time with Livingston uh, so when something happened to him, he could take over the ministry. Well, he noticed that all throughout the day, uh, Livingston was preaching, he was teaching, he was uh, meeting with the people, he was out in, uh, doing everything he could to help people uh, receive the Lord as their Savior. They both shared a tent at night, so when it came time to go to bed, he noticed that Livingston just popped down on his knees, wasn't there but about a minute, and then he hopped into bed. And the young, young preacher said, uh, I noticed you didn't pray very long when you prayed. And he said, I stay prayed up. I pray all the time. So I just need to tell the Lord good night because I've been praying in an attitude of prayer all the time. And that's what God expects for you and I to do. Stay in an attitude of prayer so that when we pray, uh, when something pops up, we pray about it and God uh, answers it for it. First Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. Then here's something really important. Colossians chapter 1 verse 9 says, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. You know, one of the things he's teaching us here is you don't stop praying for somebody till God answers the prayer. So I'll ask you tonight, is there uh, some people's name that you've put in, a, in the trash can uh, that God never did answer the prayer? Go back and get it out and start praying for them again. It's God's will. You know, sometimes God wants us to persevere before he answers the prayer. So if you've quit praying for somebody that didn't get the prayer answered, pull it back out and keep praying. Because he says in Colossians 1, 9, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. It's important to remember that God answers prayer. Let me give you some of my favorite scriptures. Jeremiah 33, 3. Uh, God said, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. So that's just God's challenge. You know, prayer is just like God giving us a 
blank checks that's already signed. I mean, we can just call unto God, and whatever the need is, he answers. Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Psalm chapter 50, verse 15. And call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. That's one of my favorite uh, claims for prayer, is that uh, in, our, in the day of trouble, we pray and ask God to come through for us, and he said, you pray, I'll deliver, and then you can just spend some time glorifying me and thanking me for that. Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. Why? That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Here's a great scripture. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 19. He will be very gracious unto thee at the voice of thy cry, cry being prayer, and when he shall hear it, he will answer thee. So God answers prayer. I want you to turn your Bible, to, if you will, to Psalms 34 and look beginning in verse 15. Psalms chapter 34, verse 15. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open unto their cry. Think about that. We are children of God. We serve God. We live for God. So we pray. And the Bible says the Lord hears our prayer. In verse 17, he says, The righteous cry, or the righteous pray, and the Lord heareth and delivereth them out of all their troubles. Verse 19 says, Many are the affliction of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. James 4, 2 says, Ye have not because ye ask not. It's a great scripture in Matthew chapter 7. In verse 7 and, 8, 7 and 8, and here's what Jesus said. He said, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Watch this now. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. One of the theologians reminded us that ask and seek and knock are all action verbs which means that we're to continually do it. We're not to just do it once and then quit. Ask and keep asking. Seek and keep seeking. Knock and keep knocking, and it'll be given unto you. And then Jesus said in Matthew chapter 21 and verse 22, In all things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. And then in John 15, 7, Jesus said, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. So we talked about we're to love one another. We're to be patient with one another. We're to forgive one another and encourage one another and bear one another's burdens, and then we're to pray for one another. Now I want you to turn your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and look at verse 33. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 33. Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, watch this now, tarry one for another. And we don't normally use that word tarry anymore, but tarry means to wait on one another, to wait on one another. So again, what he's saying here uh, in verse 33 is, Wherefore, brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another, or to wait on each other. Now, when we have to wait on somebody, the vice that comes up is impatience. We're not patient. We don't like to wait on people. But he's telling us that there are people in our life that don't have the same speed that we have. And if we're going to be together, we're going to have to slow down or speed up so that whatever we do, we can do it together. We wait on somebody, uh, <clears throat> and we do that because... If we don't wait on them, then we can't spend some time with them. I'm going to give you four scriptures, and I want you to think about this. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2 commands us to be patient with each other. Ephesians 4, 2. Be patient with one another. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 says, Love is expressed by being patient. If we love somebody, we're patient with them. That's why grandparents uh, are so patient with their grandchildren. They weren't patient with their children 
uh, but that deep love that comes with these grandkids causes us to be patient with them. Galatians chapter 5 verse 22 says, a fruit of the Spirit is patience. When the Holy Spirit runs our life and controls our life, we automatically are patient. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 14 says that we're to be patient toward all men. So when he says tarry one with another, we have to learn to wait on each other, first of all because of a physical condition. Again, sometimes, you know, we get, uh, when we get sick and get all bunged up, uh, people are going to we're gonna have to be patient with us about that. God created through our temperaments uh, different speeds. A couple of the temperaments uh, are uh, fast and decisive. Uh, the sanguines and the uh, cholerics uh, are just bulldog type uh, people. Uh, and the phlegmatic and the melancholic uh, are a little bit slower and more decisive in what they do. Uh, also, our age, as we get older, we tend to slow down. How many of you have noticed that? Have you all noticed that? We get a little bit older, we slow down. Uh, about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, our get up and go done gone up and went, right? And that's why we have to go home and take a shower, and then we can come back at 7 o'clock and do our thing. Sometimes people have to, we have to slow down for people that are older. And then also those that have physical uh, limits, sickness or handicap. And, and I got some good news about Lana. As you know, a few weeks ago, she uh, uh, fell and broke her leg in two places. Well, she went to the doctor today and the doctor released her. Uh, so she's going to be able to come back and start working with us Monday. And we're really grateful about that. We have to wait on each other. When Moses and the children of Israel were on their way out of Egypt, on their way to the promised land, uh, Moses stopped them at the edge of the promised land and took 12 men, one from each of the 12 tribes, and had them go in and survey uh, the promised land. They came back and they said, uh, we, can't, we can't go in there. Moses said, why? They said, because there's giants in there. And they said, those giants are as tall as the cedars of Lebanon. Now, the cedars of Lebanon were 30 feet tall. And they have found bones of giants that were 30 feet tall. So if you're six foot tall and you go in and here's a bunch of, uh, one whole tribe of the Canaanites, uh, <laughs> and they're 30 feet tall, uh, you're saying, you know, uh, I think we better pass on this. But Joshua and Caleb, uh, they said, we need to go. God has led us here. God, we saw him work those ten plagues to get us here. We saw him open up the Red Sea and destroy all of Pharaoh and his army. So all we need to do is trust God. Let's get on with it, Joshua and Caleb said. But they voted on it, and they voted to not do that. So for the next 40 years, that whole generation wandered around in the wilderness and not one of them except for Joshua and Caleb got to go in the promised land. Joshua and Caleb uh, stayed with that group. And somebody said, well, why would Joshua and Caleb stay with them? Because that's the only way he could be with them. But you'd understand that, that if we are going to do things together, uh, we've got to one slow down, the other speed up. That's the only way we can be together. You know, uh, we uh, lived with people that are hurt and they move slow emotionally. We have some folks that uh, we have mental issues and they're a little bit slower to grasp things. And so we have to do that. I used to watch the circus guys that did the juggling. And, and, and some of the jugglers could juggle three bottles and they would keep it going. But then they would try to do four and then they'd start dropping one. Their, their capacity was three. But then another juggler would come out and he could juggle six. He had the capability of doing that. Well, uh, we have people around us that are limited and so it's important for us to um, uh, wait on each other, to slow up. So whatever we have to do to be together. Picture a man and a wife go to the mall. The wife, for example, is... Uh, 
is a, is a sanguine. So she is just wide open. Uh, husband is a phlegmatic, and he is just slow. If they are going to stay together, she's got to slow up, and he's got to speed up. It's important for us to realize that to stay together, we have to accept people as we are. You guys are good at that, and I, I want to brag on you for that. You're really good at accepting other people that, that are not like us. You know, we don't run on the same uh, tune, uh, but we're all children of God, and we all have a will. God has a will, His will for us, and we have to just make sure that we all can tarry with one another. Uh, someone has well said that waiting helps us to focus on the more important issues of life. When we have too many irons in the fire, we tend to, bur to burn out. Waiting also, the experts say, frees people to be more comfortable around us. If we, are, if we pace ourselves, uh, people don't mind being around us, but none of us like to be around people that are impatient. They just make us nervous. Waiting on one another lets people know that we love and care about them. I read a heart-wrenching story this past week, I'll never forget it, about a father who had a handicapped son. His handicapped son was nine years old, and his name was Shay. And uh, he was really crippled and bunged up. He, he just, could just barely walk. Um, and, uh, and his dad said, I, I had took him out to the park, and we were just walking around in the park, and, and there were some boys playing baseball. And he said, Shay looked up at me and he said, Daddy, do you think those boys would let me play ball with them? And the dad said, I cringed at the thought because he couldn't, he'd never had a bat in his hand and he couldn't run. But he said, I didn't want to disappoint him. So he said, I said, Shay, let's go ask them. So they went over and the father said to one of the boys, he said, boys, would it be all right for Shay to play with y'all? And one of the little boys said, well, sir, right now, we are six point behind. But in the last of the ninth inning, we'll let Shay come in and play. And the father said, in the ninth inning, they scored six runs. And he said, the, when it came to the last play of the ninth inning, they could either win or lose the ball game. So he said, I thought, they're not, they're not ever going to let this boy play ball. That last person to bat is going to win this game for us or lose it. But he said the boy came over and he gave the bat to Shay. And he said they, uh, the dad said he lined him up there, put the bat in his hand. And he said the pitcher saw what was happening. So he said he walked up a few steps, got closer, and then he just barely lobbed it. Well, he said when Shea swung, he didn't even get close to it. So he said the pitcher got even closer. And he said one of the other boys on, he, on Shea's team, one of the other boys came over and put his arms around him and put his arms on the bat. And he said when that guy easily lobbed the ball, he swung it and hit it and said it, the ball went about three yards. And he said, all of the team started saying, Shay, run to first base, run to first base. So he said, I watched my son as he just waddled toward first base. And he said, the fielder noticed what was going on, so he threw a wild throw to him. And everybody was screaming, Shay, run to second base. And he said, I saw my son, a big smile on his face, and he was waddling to second base. And then he said, and, uh, and the fielder throwed it at wild again on purpose. And they said, Shay, run to third base. So he said, my son, his eyes was this big and his mouth was so, uh, so big. And he said, at third base, they were telling him, Shay, run home. You made a grand slam. You won the game for us. So he said, from third base to home, that entire team was surrounding him, uh, urging him to get up there and touch the base. And he said, what surprised him most of all was that both teams put him on their shoulder and carried him around, smiling at him and saying, hey, you won the game for us. I want to read you what the father said as he saw this happen. 
He said, with tears streaming down my face, I said, those 18 boys that day determined or demonstrated to my son God's perfect love for each of us. He said, Shay, for the rest of his life, will never forget some boys that loved him enough to wait on him in his handicap and let him make a home run. And I thought when I read that whole thing that that's the way it should be in our church. In our church, we have such a variety of people, and it's really important for us to express our love for each other by being really patient and waiting on them. Let me talk to our Internet audience. The greatest choice you'll ever make in your life is to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. I want you to know tonight that God loves you, that He cares about you. Jesus died on a cross for your sins. Romans chapter uh, 8 and verse 5 says that God committed His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You've heard all of your life that Jesus died on the cross. Well, He died on the cross for you. And He did that because He loves you. Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The reason we have live stream and the reason we uh, have four different venues that we live stream over is that we want to tell everybody like we're going to tell you tonight that God loves you and that Jesus will forgive you and save you if you'll invite him to come into your heart. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And if what I say in this prayer is what you feel in your heart, I want to ask you to pray this prayer. It can go just simply something like this. Dear Jesus, I realize I'm a sinner and I realize that I need a Savior. And Jesus, I believe that you are the one that can save me. So Jesus, right now I am asking you to come into my heart, forgive my sins and save my soul and give me your gift of eternal life. And I'm asking it, Jesus, in your name. Now, if you prayed that prayer and you're on the Internet, I want you to stay on the Internet. I've got some really important stuff that I want to talk to you about. In the auditorium, would you... Thank you so very much for worshiping the Lord with us over the Internet today. Our church is in our invitation at this time, and I'd like to spend just a couple of minutes with you this morning. You know, the greatest choice that anyone makes in life is the choice to accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. If you've never trusted Him as your Savior, I'd like to give you God's simple plan of salvation so that right now, wherever you are, you can invite Jesus into your heart. He'll come in and forgive and save you just right there where you are. The greatest choice in life is to invite Jesus into your heart. God's simple plan of salvation says that all of us have sinned and all of us need God's forgiveness. Romans chapter 3 verse 23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But you know what? God still loves us even though we've sinned. And God still loves you. So God provided a way for us to be forgiven. And that way is through the death of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. The Bible says when He died on the cross, He died on the cross for your sins to pay your sin debt. Romans 5 8 says, But God commendeth His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And you know, God has a plan. And that plan says He's got a gift that He wants to give you. And that gift will be yours when you invite Him into your heart. Romans chapter 6 verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We get this gift by inviting Jesus to come into our heart and be our Savior. Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. When I got saved, I didn't know how to call upon the Lord, and so someone helped me, and I'd like to help you. If you've never invited Jesus into your heart, but you want to, it happens when you pray a simple prayer, meaning it in your heart. That prayer would go something like this. I'll say the words, you pray the prayer in your own heart, meaning it, and the Lord will come into your life. Here's the prayer. Dear God, I realize I'm a sinner. 
I understand that my sin has a penalty, and that penalty is death, a separation from you forever. But I also believe Jesus on the cross died for my sins. And I'm asking you, dear Lord, to come into my heart right now, forgive my sins, and save my soul. And dear friend, if you prayed that prayer, and you meant that with all your heart, Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that's what you just did. You just called upon the Lord. And based upon the Word of God, the Bible says that Jesus has come into your heart and given you eternal life. We'd like to help you. If you'll contact us here at Northside Baptist Church, I have some great material that we'll send to you and help you in your Christian life. God bless you now. Join us for our next service.